Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. There hasn't been a lot of research on the time between doses. What COVID vaccine delays mean for British Columbians waiting for their second dose. Also. To find out that you're, you can't hold anybody accountable for your child's death. That's hard. Grieving families call for change to BC's wrongful death laws and. But, you know, if you were to say that in India, we would kill you. A BC activist threatened over his support for farmers holding protests in India. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Mike is off tonight. Well, Canada is expected to ramp up vaccine distributions this week with more shipments set to arrive to each of our provinces. But there's concern it may be too late. Our Isabel Ragam is finding out there are some people here in B.C. who have had their first dose, but the time frame required for their second dose has already passed. So it is on my mind. I am counting days. Jody Vance was among the first in line to be vaccinated in B.C. Her father is in a long-term care home in Delta, and she's a designated essential visitor, which means she was also given priority. They both received their first shot over a month ago. I received my first dose on January 10th, and I am patiently waiting to get my second dose and trying my very best to not be concerned about how many days in between. Early on, the province decided to delay the second dose from the recommended 35 days later to 42 instead, a bid to get the first dose into as many arms as possible. But in Vance's case, that 42-day window closed last Friday, and the timeline is even more critical for her 82-year-old father. Oh, I'm hoping that this week or next, Dad will have received his, his second dose. The way these vaccines have, have uh, rolled out, there hasn't been a lot of research on the time between doses. And, and I was trying to understand that even before I got my first dose of the vaccine, of what exactly that time in between means. Is there a window of urgency there? Leading scientists still have questions about the impact of prolonged delays for second doses. Uh, I think Canada needs to be prepared more, and I know that they're making efforts now to produce the vaccine here. Horatio Bach is an infectious disease expert at UBC. He's critical of distribution plans that deliver the first dose without knowing for sure when the second dose would come. The problem is the supply of the of the companies. If you go outside of this uh, uh, specific time, you don't know what will happen. So it's a big question mark. We don't know if it will work. I'm just ready. <laughs> While Vance is eagerly waiting for that second shot, she says she remains very grateful for the first one. This could have saved my dad's life. I don't know. Uh, and I'll take it. The government is expected to face questions about vaccine supply during its next COVID update Tuesday. Isabel Regam, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, new pandemic entry rules are now in effect at Canada's land border crossings. Non-essential travelers entering from the U.S. will have to show proof of a negative COVID test taken in the U.S. within 72 hours of arrival or a positive test taken 14 to 90 days before arrival. Some warn, though, travelers could run into problems. So you run into some bad traffic or bad weather and things like that, it's conceivable you could have had that test done and now you're, you're racing against time to make sure it still falls within the 72 hours. Starting Monday, travelers will also need to be tested for the virus upon arrival at the border. And on Monday, air travelers will be forced into a mandatory three-day hotel quarantine at their own expense. The federal government says it's looking into regular testing for essential workers and truck drivers to ensure they're not the source of any new infection. Public Health Canada says those who've received COVID-19 vaccines will still be required to follow the new rules. Well, this family day in BC, many of us can't gather with those we are closest to because of the pandemic. But there are others in this province who can't be with their loved ones because of death. As Tina Lovegreen reports, some of those same people are using today to call on the province to change its wrongful death laws. My daughter was worthless. My father was worthless. 
a powerful and emotional video featuring 14 families, worthless. all who've lost loved ones because of a wrongful act, worthless. and told worthless. there's no legal recourse. Worthless is the harsh reality of how the justice system treats our, our families and our loved ones. Anne Foray's 29-year-old daughter Natasha died four months ago from an untreated staph infection despite repeated visits to Lionsgate Hospital. But because Natasha didn't have children or a mortgage, her family can't sue for damages because in BC, unlike other provinces, the Family Compensation Act only considers income loss, not grief or sorrow. So my daughter's future was worthless and is worthless. Like her, she had a whole life ahead of her and it means nothing. So there's just, it's unacceptable. This has to change. Using her skills and connections as a casting director, she created this PSA to spark change, featuring families like Shelley James, whose daughter Chelsea died after the door of the party bus she was on swung open during a turn. That bus wasn't safe. She went through the main door on a turn that opened up when it was moving and was fed to the, uh, the wheels of the vehicle, she died instantly, you know, and that's not right. Like somebody should be held accountable. Follow-up investigations would reveal the door was defective, but criminal charges weren't recommended. Yeah, and to find out that you're, you can't hold anybody accountable for your child's death, that's hard. For them, it's so unsatisfactory. Trial lawyer Anthony Leone says the law needs to be modernized to value all human life, regardless of the person's earning capacity at the time of death. Other Western provinces have uh, a cap where everybody gets the same amount for a wrongful death, and, and those caps are set at, we say, too low amounts in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but at least those provinces recognize that when somebody dies as a result of somebody else's fault, there is a base level of damages that are awarded, and that achieves a deter deterrence function, which is important under the tort law, because if there's no punishment for people who do things wrong, there's no deterrence to prevent that from happening in the future. Attorney General David Eby says updating the law is a priority and reform will come within his government's mandate. But the families would like to see changes in six months, not four years' time. I don't want to be doing this, and as I said to the Attorney General, I shouldn't be having to do this. I shouldn't be having to not only grieve my daughter, but put myself out there in the public and try to find some justice and accountability for my 29-year-old daughter who died due to negligence. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. The search is on tonight for a man who allegedly tackled a woman walking alone in Vancouver's West End on Saturday night. At this point in the investigation, the attack is believed to be completely unprovoked. The victim was shopping on Davie Street uh, Saturday night around 9.40 p.m. Uh, and she was walking home. Uh, she uh, left Davie Street and was walking in the lane and uh, she heard some footsteps behind her. Um, suddenly somebody, a man, came up from behind her, uh, grabbed her and tackled her to the ground. Uh, the woman screamed, screamed quite loudly, and we believe this scared away the attacker. The suspect is believed to be white, about 5 feet 11 inches tall and in his mid-40s. He was wearing a waist-length black leather jacket, dark pants and a dark COVID mask. The incident happened around 9.40 p.m. in Maxine Lane near Butte and Thurlow Street. Anyone with information is asked to call the VPD or Crime Stoppers on the numbers on your screen. Well, Vancouver's additional shelter spaces get set to close this week. Advocates fear what will happen to people living on the streets in these cold temperatures. The extreme weather response, we have a few more days of that. That's great. It's excellent. We need to continue with that. Um, but it doesn't solve the long-term problem, which is so many people are experiencing homelessness and won't have uh, support into uh, later in February and March and April. In fact, uh, right now people are uh, facing kind of a new challenge with the wet snow, the wet rain, the wet cold that's coming. When temperatures began to drop last week, Vancouver added more than 100 shelter spaces, but those will all go away on Wednesday. Hanka says when that happens, more people will show up at the permanent shelters like the Union Gospel Mission. It also means more people will be turned away. 
He and other advocates say the long-term solution is more permanent housing for those who are most vulnerable. Two hikers are now safe after being rescued by North Shore crews Sunday night. They got stranded on steep, icy terrain on Grouse Mountain. The call came in at 7 p.m. Two men in their 20s who were ill-equipped and wearing running shoes had slid down steep slopes near the Grouse Grind. Now, the trail is currently closed to the public, and the pair had to be rescued using 100 meters of rope. North Shore Rescue is reminding potential hikers to be aware of slippery conditions and plan ahead with the proper gear. And time now for the forecast. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. Joe, it was a beautiful weekend. <laughs> I really enjoyed the snow and I actually got to go sledding for the first time in uh, quite a few years. Aww, with I'm guessing, did you bring uh, your little daughter too? I did, on you went out for the first time. That's she, the best. I, I don't know if she liked it or not, but uh, I saw little <laughs> Wesley, he seemed to be enjoying his time out there. Yeah, the kids, I mean, the snow event this weekend was really for the kids and the kids and all of us. But it is coming to an end. Let me show you the current temperatures right now. Uh, we have a bit of snow still falling in through Chilliwack, but temperatures are on the plus side now, a four and through YVR. So all of that snow quickly melting through the day today. And that did come with rain that continues to fall uh, through the south coast. Really light now. Uh, the warnings are still in place in through the Fraser Valley, east of Abbotsford. We're still seeing some light accumulations, but Anita, I think... That is all she wrote for the snow, for this event anyway, but I'll take you through our long-range forecast coming up. Sounds good, Johanna. Thank you. You're welcome. A BC activist is one of many Canadians getting insults and threats over their support for farmers in India. They're protesting laws they say will destroy their livelihoods. And as Philip Lee Chinook explains, activists believe there that they are the target of coordinated attempts to try to silence them. The pandemic hasn't stopped Canadians here from protesting in person and online. Whatever is happening, it's happening in India. All we're doing is just sharing it. And when this popular social influencer who posts on everything from fashion to social justice signaled her support for Indian farmers on Instagram, personal attacks and threats followed. It would start with the name calling, then it would just go like the different route. And I've gotten threats where they, they have said like, oh, you deserve to be raped and stuff like that. Peel Regional Police say so far two people have lodged formal complaints. And while she hasn't, she's concerned about attempts to intimidate her into silence. What if this person shows up at my house? What if this person tries to find where I live and then they try to like, you know, uh, come uh, after me or at my work. And, and it's not just things. here. So One of the founders of a social justice group in British Columbia uh, has come under a sustained attack after launching a campaign called Ask India Why. It would be like, how dare you question India on its human rights record? Um, you're just saying that from the safety of Canada, you're cowards. And then they kind of be followed up with, you know, if you were to say that in India, we would kill you. After celebrities like pop star Rihanna and climate activist Greta Thunberg added their voices through social media, he was accused of using his tech branding firm to pay them to support Indian farmers. So there was all sorts of weird conspiracies they were bandying about last week, like, you know, we paid Rihanna two and a half million dollars for a tweet and all sorts of other garbage. He believes they're being targeted by pro-government troll farms because he says posters all use similar wording and images of violence, which he says is a not-so-subtle threat about what will happen if he doesn't stop speaking out. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. A small business here in Vancouver is already leading the way, but are Canadian consumers at big box stores ready to change habits? After the break, a plan for grocers to be even more environmentally friendly. Thank you for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Well, a Calgary doctor is one of the people who got in on the wild and crazy investment ride around GameStop. Late last month, the company's stock skyrocketed from $18 a share to $380. The doctor spoke with the CBC about how he heeded the call to save the struggling retailer. This is the website. It has different memes. And then they're making fun of people who bought at 
$250 plus and now it's dropping. And then as you go down, you can see some technical analysis. So it's a, it's a hodgepodge of whatever is going on in the markets and then you have to scroll through it, sit through it and find what's useful and what's not useful for you. Their goal is to point out uh, and find out hidden gems and they tell other people and it kind of becomes like a group wisdom kind of thing. Somebody posted an article saying that 140% of the GameStop stock was being shorted. I'm just quickly gonna explain to everyone what a short is. If you have a friend and you borrow a Pokemon card from him and you say to your friend, I'm gonna return this card to you in about three months and then you sell it in the open market for $20. Your hope is that the value of the card goes down in three months, so you can buy it off the market for $5 and pocket the extra $15 after you return the card to your friend. Because with your friend, the only deal is that you have to return the same card to them. And these people were betting on this company failing so that once they go bankrupt, they can make more and more money. There was no end to the greed. They kept on pushing this company's stock price down, down, down. And that's when this whole movement started for this Reddit group that we're going to save this company that we all have nostalgia for by buying their stock. The stock peaked at around $400. These hedge funds were panicking. They lost billions of dollars. And some people were referring to it as the greatest transfer of wealth. I know of people who bought 5,000 shares of GameStop at a cost price of $38. So when the stock rose to $90, they sold, making a profit. If they would have held that 5,000 shares and sold it at even 350, about 1.6 million US dollars. I still have a small position in GameStop. Even though that the stock price will go down, we're ex we believe in the principle and we're holding on to that principle despite the money that we're losing because it's a matter of principle now. A lot of the, these folks, what they did is they took their winnings, they went to an actual GameStop, bought some consoles and then donated it to the children's hospital. So as a way of giving back to the business, as well as giving back to the community, they beat billionaire hedge funds at their own game, playing by the rules and just using their rules and their greed against them. This was game-changing money for people. People putting their student loans into it. And that's that also comes with the risk that you're gonna, that you could potentially lose this. You're believing a stranger on, online. What this tells you is that you find something and then you do your own research. You do your own due diligence or DD as they like to call it. Okay, stick with us. We'll be back in just a few moments with more news from around Canada. Reusable containers could soon be coming to a grocery store near you. Loblaws is rolling out a pilot program this week. As Tashana Reed explains, it has one Vancouver-based small business excited to see large-scale companies joining the cause. Doorstep delivery. Everyday grocery items in stainless steel, glass jars, and durable containers. But instead of a toss into the recycling bin, these containers are going to be picked up and used again. It's a concept the Canadian founder of Loop is selling to big-scale retailers. The world's biggest organizations in, uh, who are manufacturers and retailers are taking it very seriously. Loop's reusable packaging concept has already taken off in the U.S., the U.K., and France. Now, customers in Ontario can test it through online delivery with grocery chain Loblaws. You can only enter Loop as a manufacturer if your package can sustain 10 or more reasonable uh, full trips. Uh, and if it one day breaks, then the materials have to be recyclable back into that same package. Customers pay deposits for reusable containers, like this haagen stainless steel ice cream bin that can be reused up to 100 times. The goal? To divert waste from ending up here. And you know what's exciting too about this? Is that it's being led by industry, by companies. It's not being led by government. Environmentally friendly concepts like this have been embraced by small businesses across Canada. Former marine biologist Brianne Miller opened NADA, a zero packaging grocery store five years ago. Her customers can choose to order their products in donated used containers. More than 95% of our products that are going out the door, people are choosing uh, upcycled packaging. 
Miller says she's excited to see a large-scale grocer in Canada offering a reusable option. They ultimately do have the opportunity to influence a huge number of people. The challenge now, getting consumers on board. How do you get people to actually literally buy into this? Because there will be a cost to doing so. And it's not only just a financial cost, but they have to change their behavior. Loop and Loblaws says if the online pilot is successful, they'll bring the reusable options in store later this year. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. University students in B.C. are campaigning to recruit more black Canadians to become stem cell donors. Health experts say there's a major health disparity when it comes to black people in need of a transplant. As John Hernandez reports, the wait to find a match can be long and life-threatening. My loneliness is killing me. It's a serious message packed into a TikTok. Ooh. University students from Vancouver to Halifax leveraging the power of social media to hopefully save lives. They're members of the Stem Cell Club, a group that originated at UBC that has since spread to campuses across Canada. This year, they're campaigning to get more black Canadians to enter the country's stem cell registry. Right now, black Canadians make about 3% of the entire Canada's uh, population, but um, they make up less than 2% on Canada's stem cell registry. And this poses a problem, especially for patients, black patients in need of uh, life-saving stem cell transplants. Hundreds of Canadians need stem cell donations each month. The treatment helps fight diseases like leukemia, but black patients are less than half as likely to find a matching unrelated donor. People from the same ethnic and racial group have a high tendency of having the same um, genetic markers, so the HLA markers, and that's why we're trying to, you know, get more black um, donors to register. And in some cases, not finding one can be fatal. If those patients who have high-risk disease um, you know, you get the disease under control with chemotherapy, but you can't give them a transplant because they don't have a donor, um, then I worry for those patients. The Stem Cell Club has also been running focus groups to try to figure out exactly why black Canadians are underrepresented on the donor sheet. Number one, it's the mistrust um, between the, um, the black community and the medical um, community. And, 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 and this is a historical problem. It's not something we can solve overnight. So mistrust that's led to unequal health outcomes, something these campaigners hope to change. We can go out there and like create awareness. Those looking to donate can register with Canadian Blood Services. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Ready to get lost? Well, after COVID delays and unseasonably warm weather, the world's largest snow maze opens up right here in Canada. We'll take you there next. And at 621, a live look northbound down Georgia Street, downtown Vancouver. If you enjoyed that dump of snow over the weekend, sorry to tell you it isn't happening again this week. So what can you expect? Joe is here next to tell us. Every year, more and more Canadian motorists are buying their gasoline in the United States. The trend began when our gas prices were pushed up by federal taxes, just as American prices began to drop. As the trend continues, concern is growing among business operators in British Columbia, and so is the determination to lobby for change. Karen Webb reports. Canadian. But in Canada, that tank of gasoline would have cost $35 Canadian, maybe more. And that's why every driver in the service station lineup in Washington is actually Canadian. And each one tells the same story. Save about $8 a tank. That's why. I'm tired of paying BC prices. Way too high. We make this stuff and we sell it for more. I find that hard to believe. But true. Gasoline in Blaine, Washington, barely a kilometer across the border, costs $1.12 an American gallon, cash. Convert that to Canadian liters and dollars, a motorist from British Columbia will save 12 to 13 cents a liter. And that makes a trip to the United States just to pick up gasoline worthwhile. Now that the government sees all the Canadians coming down here, maybe they're going to, uh, you know, put a ban on it, like a law, and nobody's allowed to come back unless they declare it, and then it's going to be not worthwhile uh, to do it, you know. 
The cars lined up to cross the border are evidence it's worth it, and becoming more so every day. It started almost five years ago, when the federal government hiked their taxes on gasoline. Every time the Canadians raise their prices in Canada, uh, two cents or three cents a liter, well, it seems like uh, we get a jump in business. It just keeps going up. At the same time, American prices are going down, because international oil prices are going down. Canadian prices are stubbornly high and staying so. The major effect is seen in a town like White Rock. You can actually see Blaine from White Rock, but here the service station lots are empty. We had one yesterday, got 55 cents one liter just to get across the line. According to the manager of this Canadian station, the major problem is Canadian taxes. We feel there's too much taxes in gasoline itself. Uh, on the average, I would say gasoline should probably be in the neighborhood 40, 45 cents a liter. Have a heart, Valentine. Tax the gas tax. That's what these British Columbia business operators are saying. They're part of a growing campaign to ask government to bring down the tax. We're not asking government to be irresponsible. We're asking them for a balanced reduction in the cost of fuel to a more competitive level. So the Premier and the Prime Minister both got the same Valentine this week. Ask the gas tax, it says, because what they're worried about is Expo. All those American tourists driving north this summer to spend their money in Canada. They don't want them to fill up first in Blaine. They're not likely to get what they want from the province. Expo is Premier Bennett's baby. But the province thinks any cut in taxes should come from the federal government because it doesn't have to maintain the roads that lead to Expo. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us once again for the full forecast. Or are we at least getting some sun this week? We are, Anita. Yeah, we are coming out the other side of the polar vortex and into the sun. Let me show you the big picture, though, as that Arctic air retreats from B.C. Take a look at this. It's headed into Atlantic Canada. That's the pink. And as far south as Texas. Big story in Texas with how cold it's been. The Gulf of Mexico shores will be minus 15 degrees tomorrow morning. Normal temperatures for this time of the year are more like uh, my, uh, plus 15. Uh, we get that Pacific air though and that is going to come with clearing skies as I take you through Tuesday morning. Just a few lingering showers and the risk of some more accumulating snow as I mentioned east of Chilliwack. But look at that. Lots of sunshine for the south coast for tomorrow uh, and we get to keep that sunshine through Wednesday as well. A quick look across the province and we've got uh, some sunshine happening for the interior as, as well. A couple more centimeters in through Kelowna tomorrow. Uh, with that same system as it tracks east, as that polar vortex tracks east. Nice that we get to say goodbye to it for a little while. Here's a look at our trending upwards temperatures. Uh, six right now, in or six tomorrow uh, for Vancouver, and uh, a six for Wednesday as well. And by the time we get the weekend, I think we could be uh, closer to our seasonals of seven and eight for this time of the year. I do see our showers return for Thursday. But all in all, we're saying goodbye to winter for a moment, Anita. Well, we're getting closer to spring, so I'm happy about that. Me too. Thanks, Joe. Oh, and we are now going into this next story, uh, giving a new life to walking in a winter wonderland. In fact, you might get lost walking around because it's the world's largest snow maze and it's now open. Well, this is our opening day. It's uh, maybe it's fitting, it's Valentine's and we obviously love snow and we love winter in Manitoba. So this is opening day. I just thought it would be a great Valentine's Day activity. Yeah, it's nice out, it's sunny and it's, it's gonna be a great day for it. All that warm weather that everyone was enjoying in January and lots of December, we were frustrated with it. Our usual time to build a maze, we can typically, about 12 working days, kind of gets us the maze built. I mean, now this one, we started at the same time. We started about mid-December, but I mean, we're just nicely getting finished now. So we made our snow maze 91% bigger, and we do have the world's title as the largest maze. And so when you increase that by 91%, I mean, that added to the build, you know, 
very costly to add that much. So we added just square footage so that we can keep people apart. And in addition, we added two feet to the paths. So they were six feet and now they're eight feet so that everyone can maintain social distancing while they're in the maze. We also added uh, a bunch of snow buildings and snow huts with, uh, with artwork and things to find inside. So the, building, the build was absolutely twice what we've ever done before for energy and efforts. We have our big blue uh, luge run, we call it the blue streak. Um, and uh, so that's a really fast, that's not for everybody slide. And then we have Snow Mountain, that's a more general sliding hill and we pl provide toboggans for that as well. And then on, uh, not when it's minus uh, 29, but when the weather is conducive to that, we actually have uh, horse-drawn uh, sleigh rides as well that go on the weekends. Well, that is pretty cool, literally. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> That is awesome. Uh, I wish we had something like that here to go check out, but we'll have to wait till next year, maybe a little more snow. That is it for our program tonight. You can always find it online, cbc.ca slash BC. And Mike and I are back here as well as Johanna tomorrow night. See you then.